Well, it's great to have Ron Lamb speaking to us today. And he's going to be preaching to us from John 14, verses 1 to 11, which I'll read out now. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you? Such a long time. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. Well, thank you to the guys uh, for leading worship this morning. It's great to be encouraged in that way. Now, I've said it before, and at the risk of repeating myself, I'm going to say it again. I do not like this lockdown. It's not simply because personal holidays and special events have been cancelled, although that hasn't helped. It's not simply that I couldn't get a haircut for four months or go out for a coffee, or to the library or the gym, although that hasn't helped either. It's not even because of the daily government bad news about the virus death toll, nor the stumbles that the government has made in trying to manage the crisis. It's, I, think, I think it's a bit more fundamental than that. It's because of this, because relational connections have been severely disrupted. I miss people. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm grateful for the technology we're able to use to keep in touch with people and do a form of church. It's certainly been helpful to have online church, like the Sunday morning, online small groups, online prayer meetings. But I think we'd have to agree it's not the same as meeting together in person. Is it such a strange thing to say, I miss you? The Apostle John, in his second letter, wrote this. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. For me, the worst thing has been the inability to meet with people face to face, to shake hands, to give a hug, to share a meal together, to have church together, to worship and pray together. Now, last week, I spoke at uh, King's Church Amersham, and they've decided to do their Sunday morning worship and preaching live in a socially distant manner. Now, different churches do things in different ways. Not necessarily better or worse, but just different. And after taking my temperature to get in the building, which was 36.2 degrees, my temperature, and so on, there were gels and sprays, the usual kind of thing. But it did mean I was able to be there for the live worship bit. Tell you what, it was like a cold drink in a parched land. It made me realize all the more how I miss you my family and the faith at KCHW. I miss our ability to meet together personally. I guess we need to continue to pray for an end to this virus and to be patient as well. But I shouldn't be surprised reflecting about it that I miss people, that I miss meeting face to face without feeling I might catch something nasty because we were made by God for relationship. God created mankind for relationship with him. We know the story that through human disobedience, sin came into the world and relationship with God was broken 
And very soon after that, the ultimate sign of broken relationship happened when Cain murdered his innocent brother Abel. What a mess. But God already had the solution in mind. Jesus came. He came with power, healing the sick, raising the dead, walking on the water, feeding thousands miraculously, giving sight to the blind, healing the lame, delivering people from demonic oppression, changing people's lives. And he's still doing that almost 2,000 years later. And I'm one of those people. Christianity is not simply following better rules or turning over a new leaf. It's about a restored relationship with God. And that may well lead to turning over a new leaf and living by better standards. But principally, it's about restored relationship. Now, it's one thing to believe in some kind of uh, abstract God, some spirit in the sky, some kind of spirit that we don't know much about, but is somehow connected to spiritual things that we sometimes sense. It's one thing to believe in a God who is somewhat aloof from the goings on on earth, yet has a set of rules that we must keep or else, or some kind of vague afterlife that might be good or not, depending on how good you've been. Or just thinking that we can have a kind of pick and mix spirituality, like going to an all-inclusive buffet. You know, I'll have a bit of this, a bit of that, whatever suits my taste. Or even following the latest celebrity lifestyle endorsement. It's quite another thing to believe that God wants to be up close and personal and wants to have a relationship with you and me. And yet that is what Christianity is. Christianity is personal. At this particular moment in the story, Jesus knows that he's going to be betrayed by one of his close followers. He knows that Peter, one of the inner circle of disciples, despite protestations of undying undying loyalty, is going to deny that he even knows who Jesus is. Jesus knows that he's going to die a barbaric death. He knows that his disciples are puzzled and afraid. And so he says this in verse 1, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. Now, I don't know anyone who hasn't been through or is going through a difficult time in life, whether it's uh, problematic health issues, relationship difficulties, financial problems, bereavement, or even suffering at the hands of others, and so on. Jesus is in effect saying, you trust God, so trust me. I think that there are very few people who don't know a sense of guilt and failure. Guilt over what we've done, failure to do the good we could have. But Jesus calls us all to trust him. For as the Apostle John tells us in chapter 3, verse 17, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. To save us from being alienated from God, who is the source of all life, truth, goodness and love and who created and sustains the entire universe by his own power, and yet comes to his own world to be despised and rejected. He comes to have a face-to-face encounter with you and me, to turn our darkness to light. He comes to bring God's forgiveness. He comes to bring us home. The Victorian English poet Robert Browning wrote a poem while he was in Italy, and it's called Home Thoughts from Abroad. It starts, Oh, to be in England, now that April's there. (laughs) There's a longing expressed for his homeland. We all, I guess, want to have a sense of a secure place we can call home, a place where we can relax, a place where we know we're accepted and loved. Jesus tells his disciples and us in verse 2 here, My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Well, this is the ultimate home. Now, some very wealthy business people and celebrities like uh, Sir Richard Branson and uh, the actor Johnny Depp own their own Caribbean island with a splendid villa on it. That sounds great, but it will be nothing compared to what Jesus has prepared. A permanent home in heaven where there is no sorrow, there is no sighing, there are no tears, and there is no death. 
You see, the big picture is not that we are at the hands of some random force or mysterious spirit. We're not in the hands of some aloof God who is totting up our good and bad points to see if we can make the grade. We're in the hands of God who takes the initiative. We're in the hands of God who wants to be up close and personal. We're in the hands of God who chooses to reveal himself for our good. We're in the hands of Jesus who is going to willingly suffer and give up his life on the cross so that we can come home. You believe in God, believe also in me, Jesus says. Christianity is personal. Second thing I'd like to say is this. Christianity is both exclusive and inclusive. What else does Jesus say here? He says this. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, as a young man, age 20, I thought it it didn't really matter what you believed. You would kind of get there in the end. At that time in my life, I was chatting with a friend who had recently become a Christian. My pick and mix philosophy was this at that time. Uh, Well, Jesus is certainly one of the good guys, there's no doubt about that. But there are others too. But when I heard the words that Jesus spoke, it really blew me out of the water. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, I have to say, it blew my mind. It literally stopped me dead in my tracks. I was like the proverbial rabbit caught in the headlights. But I have to say, not in a bad way. I thought, well, could it be true? Is Jesus some kind of bad guy, a liar, a fool? Or is what he says about himself true? Well, a perhaps familiar quote from C.S. Lewis that we may have heard before, but I still think it's relevant. He, the writer of the Narnia Chronicles, said this. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. Now, at that moment in my life, I couldn't believe that what Jesus was saying about himself was untrue. I just, it was too big a difference for me to believe. So I thought, well, what are the implications for me? I realized actually that I was going the wrong way. My thinking was totally wrong. My whole direction of life was wrong and I needed to change direction. The Bible calls that repentance. I didn't know it was called that at the time. At the same time as I heard the words of Jesus, I had a profound sense of the love of God. That God was not telling me off for going the wrong way in both my thinking and my actions, although I was, but that he was telling me because he had a profound love for me. Wow, not much wonder it blew me out of the water. I am the way and the truth and the life. Not just a case of, I will show you the way, the way to God, the way to what life is all about, the way to eternal life. No, I am the way. Not just a case of, I will show you the truth, the truth about life, God, and so on. No, I am the truth. Not just a case even of, I will show you what life really means. No, I am the life. The way and the truth and the life are to be found in Jesus himself. The way to God, the way to life, the truth about God and why we're here, what our purpose is, the salvation life that lasts forever, they're found in Jesus, in our connection with him. Jesus, when he was around, got often got up close and personal with people. Let me give you some examples of that. The woman at the well, the woman with the continual blood loss, the blind man by the side of the road whom Jesus called to be with him, The tax collector up in a tree, Jesus called him down. Nicodemus, the great religious teacher of Israel, Jesus met him at night. The man who was born blind, the thief on the cross, Jesus wants to get up close and personal with you and me. Even if we've been a Christian for decades, that truth is still what it's about. I remember 
My late father-in-law, Frank Matthews, who used to lead the church here at KCHW, his refrain would often be this, that Jesus should always be at the center of church life. I have to say, I totally agree. Jesus often cut to the heart of the matter. On one occasion, when he was walking along the road with his disciples, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? You see, how we answer that question will totally affect how we see God, life, the Bible, our whole worldview, in fact. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. In other words, (laughs) when you see Jesus, you see God himself, not just some great religious teacher. If you want to know what God is like, then you have to look at Jesus, his life, his teachings, his miracles, his death, his resurrection, his sending the Holy Spirit. Well, we have ways here at King's of doing that, of exploring the Christian faith. We have a Get to Know Jesus page, in fact, on our website. Why not take a look at that? We've run an online alpha course where Christianity can be explored in more depth than this talk allows. Christianity is both exclusive and inclusive. It's exclusive in that if Jesus is to be believed, then no one comes to the Father except through me. But Christianity is inclusive in the sense that everyone is invited, but invited not on my terms, (laughs) but on Jesus' terms. For me, the understanding of who Jesus is came suddenly like someone switching on the lights in a dark room. For others I know, it's more like the dimmer switch gradually turning on the light over a period of time. But the effects are the same. Jesus not only asks, who do people say I am? But he makes it very personal. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? So to sum up, the big question is this. Who is Jesus? All other questions, believe you me, they're secondary. And I would encourage you, if you're uh, looking into this, that you can take time and opportunity to find out. We were made for eternal relationship with God. Christianity is personal. God desires to restore our broken relationship with him. Jesus makes exclusive claims, that's true but he gives an inclusive invitation. The way to God is not in lockdown, but is open. I am the way, Jesus says. As individuals and as a church, let's always aim to keep Jesus central as he is the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you that You came and you sacrificed your life so that we could have a relationship with you. Thank you that you reveal completely who God is, totally what he is like. And so, Father, I pray for every single person who is watching, who is listening to our online broadcast, that your blessing will be upon them. And I ask that the Holy Spirit will speak to them about the truth of who you are. And I ask for this in the name of Jesus. Amen.